and this is the 115th nothing in the series on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our message this morning is in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through, through 34, and is on the subject of the Lord's Supper. Now before we have the message and before we read this portion of scripture together, I would like to tell you how it fits in with this series on the person and work of the Lord Jesus. Necessary for just a moment to review where we have come in this very lengthy series, which is now almost a year old. We began last April with those messages on the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he was with the Father in the very beginning, how he was equal with God in every sense, and how at a strategic moment in history he entered the human race to be found in the likeness of a man, sin accepted. And being formed in the likeness of man, he humbled himself for a season to become the obedient servant of his Father walking in the power and energy and rights of the Holy Spirit only. He lived among men for 30, 33 years, and in this series of messages we have tried to cover some of the highlights of his life, of his ministry, and of his words. Wherever he went, he transformed the lives of men whose lives were contacted and touched by him. Men who met him were never the same. Whether they received him or whether they rejected him made no difference. Their lives were never the same again. Some who came in contact with him went their way to an eternal rejection. Some went their way to an eternal acceptance with God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in this series, we followed him through the betrayal at the hands of his friend, through his arrest, the false accusations, the trial, his conviction, his sentence, his crucifixion, his sufferings, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his post-resurrection appearances, his walk on the Emmaus Road, his visit in the upper room, his words to Peter at the Sea of Tiberias, his final words, his earthly final words on the Mount of Ascension, and finally his ascending into the glory to be seated at the right hand of God the Father. But this only really begun his work on earth, for then through the ministry of the Holy Spirit he began to do a work which had before been hidden in the wisdom of God. This work was the calling out from among the Gentiles of a people for the Lord Jesus, his Son. This people we know as the Church, the Bride of Christ. He did this through one man whose name was Saul of Tarsus. This proud Jewish rabbi, saved on Damascus Road, called as a special vessel for the use of Jesus, was commissioned by the risen Christ to go to the Gentiles with a new message which had never before been preached. This message was revealed to Paul, part of it in the wilderness of Arabia, and over a period of years the Lord Jesus revealed to him in successive revelations that there was now in effect a special age called the dispensation of grace or the church age in which without distinction of race, creed, or color, God would call by faith alone in Jesus Christ a people to be the bride of his wonderful Son. Paul had four distinct revelations from the Lord Jesus Christ during his ministry. The first distinct revelation he had direct from Christ was the revelation of the gospel that he preached. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said that he declared unto the Corinthians that which he first of all received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, 
he was buried and raised again the third day according to the scriptures. This was his gospel. He referred to it in his epistles as my gospel or our gospel. He calls it in another place the gospel of grace. He calls it in another place the gospel of God concerning his son, Jesus Christ. And then we went back to the Old Testament scriptures, those scriptures that the gospel is according to, if that's good English, and we examined from those Old Testament scriptures some highlights of the gospel. We saw the work of Calvary in the serpent lifted up upon the pole in the wilderness. We saw the work of Christ in that ram caught in the thicket by his horns, who died a substitute for the man bound upon the altar about to die. We have seen the work of Christ in the many lambs offered upon the Jewish altars, in the sacrifices of the temple and of the tabernacle. We have seen the work of Christ in the institution of the Passover, and that blessed lamb whose blood kept men safe from judgment and in whose feasting men found their fellowship. We saw the work of Christ in Psalm 22. Heard him cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then in Leviticus 16, we saw in the great day of atonement the full and wonderful work of Calvary. And then recently, those six messages from the book of Jonah, seeing Christ who descended into the deep, who for three days and nights witnessed to the grace of Calvary's finished work. And then last Wednesday, we saw him as the bearer of our curse, cursed of God for our sin, that we might be redeemed from that curse. And so we close this little portion in our series, not that we have exhausted it by any means, but because of the necessity of this series, we must press on. We have covered his first revelation, that of the gospel, and now today, and today only, we're going to touch this morning and this evening on the second revelation which Paul received direct from the Lord Jesus. This revelation is found in 1 Corinthians 11, at verse 23, for I have received of the Lord, and this is in reference to the Lord Jesus, that which also I received or delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. There seems to be so much that is lacking in the religious world's understanding of this blessed truth which we read in this portion. The proper name for what we often call communion is the Lord's Supper. 
For indeed it was the supper instituted by the Lord in the same night in which he was betrayed. If you recall the institution of the Lord's Supper, you recall that it took place in what we commonly call the Passover chamber. They had gathered together in an upper room, for Jesus said, and in the original, he said, I have had a passionate desire to eat this last Passover with you. It was his final night before Calvary. Just shortly after the institution of this supper, he was betrayed. Betrayed with a kiss by one who had lifted, lifted up that sop with him in those last few hours. And in the Passover chamber, after the celebration of the Passover feast or the memorial supper in memory of Egypt's bondage, and Israel's redemption by the blood of that original lamb, he picked up the last cup in connection with the Passover, and he gave it an entirely new meaning. And he meant that this was the last Passover for himself, and it was the last Passover for them. In this night of all nights, the historic Passover was about to be fulfilled at the cross of Calvary. These who gathered around him, who had often met year after year to remember that Passover lamb that had brought their forefathers out of Egypt's bondage, would from this night on meet from time to time to remember Christ, their Passover, who brought them from the bondage of sin and death. And picking up that last cup at the Passover supper, he said, this cup this cup represents my blood. It is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. This do ye in remembrance of me. With the bread, he said, this bread is my body. Now, it was not actually his body, and it never was. And it never did become his body. And neither does the bread of the Lord's Supper become his body in any real sense at all. He meant simply that that bread was symbolic of his body. It was representative of his body. That cup which he was about to drink was symbolic of his blood and representative of his blood. And he meant that they were to do this after he had gone. And by this simple act, the lifting of the cup, the taking of the bread together, they were to remember him in his death. The cup would remind them of the blood that had been shed for the remission of their sins. And the bread would remind them of that precious body which was given for them. Many years after he had gone back to heaven, he revealed to the Apostle Paul that this was indeed his will for the age of grace. For Paul says, I received this of the Lord, and I have delivered it unto you. And these are the same words Paul used when he spoke of the gospel that he preached. I received it from the Lord, and I delivered it unto you. So this is his second special revelation from the Lord that we in the age of grace are to meet from time to time to take together that bread and that cup in remembrance of him. First of all, the bread. The bread was received from the blessed hands of the Lord, broken. Man did not break that bread. It was already broken when they received it. It was symbolic, he said, of his body. And it's strange how we read in to the various portions of Scripture that which is not there. For instance, he was not referring to his spiritual body, the church, for when the supper was instituted, there had been no revelation whatever of the body of Christ. 
It could only have meant what those disciples took it to mean, symbolic of his own fleshly body, the body that he then occupied while he sat at that table. And henceforth the cup could only mean that blood which was yet then in his veins, but soon to be shed for the remission of their sins. And by the bread they were to remember that his body, that the entire purpose of occupying that body, the entire reason for his coming from glory to take upon himself the physical body of a man was that he might die and that in that death he might pour out his soul or shed his blood unto the remission of sins. I don't know. It gives to me an aspect I like. What is the Lord's body to me? He was God. He was very God of very God. And yet this God, creator of all, so the New Testament testifies, this mighty God who called with a word the whole universe into being, he condescended to leave that eternal state and subdue himself and submit himself to the humiliation of going about this world in the likeness of a man. And he limited himself to the limitations of a fleshly body for 33 years and went back to glory in a state he never existed in before but will for eternity. He is confined to a human body, and that body is the only thing in heaven that will for eternity bear the physical remembrance of sin. For in the book of Revelation, when we have the prophetic view of his coming again, the first thing that is noticed by John when heaven is opened, and this rider of the great white horse rides out of heaven followed by the armies of heaven, all clothed in white linen. He notices that this one who rides upon this horse, whose name is Faithful and True, who is called the Word of God, who has a name written on his thigh that no man can read, this blessed one comes in glory, but his vestures are dipped in blood. And the prophet of old said that Israel in that day will cry out and say, What are those wounds? in thine hands. And he who after 2,000 years of absence from earth will reply, the wounds whereby I was wounded in the house of my friends. And we're coming to that in the messages on his return in glory. But the blessed body of the Lord Jesus bears the wounds of Calvary and will forever. Now I know this is elementary, and I undoubtedly you have thought of it, but I want to impress upon you. Never speak of the Lord's nail-scarred hands. There are no scars in his hands. There are no scars in his feet. There is no scar in his blessed side, none on his brow, his face, nor back. They are wounds, wounds that will remain for eternity, for the blood that could have healed them and the blood that should have healed them was presented to God on his mercy seat for the redemption of your sins, redemption from your sins. What are those wounds in thine hands? Not are, what are those scars, vague memories of what has happened? What are those wounds? There is another good reason, and I don't want to get way ahead in this series, why the Lord's precious body remains wounded for eternity. That simple reason is that God who lives in the ever-present now, who knows not the limitations of time, is not looking back 2,000 years and by scars remembering the work of Christ. He is looking upon him as he saw him the day he died for eternity will be one long Calvary. I do not mean by that that Christ is suffering, 
and will suffer, his sufferings are finished, his sufferings are complete, but throughout eternity this blessed Lamb will bear the wounds of Calvary. I, I think of this because it is the only thing in heaven that will ever remind me of my sins. God himself said, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more against them. That is, there will never be a judicial remembrance of my sins. My sins will never come before him again. They will never be mentioned, neither at the judgment seat of Christ nor in the presence of God the Father. Sin is settled. God is satisfied. Christ has eternally propitiated him. And sins are a finished book, a canceled check. And we have that receipt in the blessed wounds of Christ. God will never remember them. They will never be, pardon the expression, thrown up to us in heaven. But every time I look upon that lamb as though he were slain, John said when he saw him in heaven, remember, in the book of Revelation, I will remember that that slain lamb was slain for me and that the wounds in his blessed hands and feet are there because he was wounded for my transgressions and bruised for my iniquities and that those blessed stripes were put there because of the chastisement of my peace. And I find in the New Testament that there is no peace apart from knowing what those wounds mean, and there is no salvation apart from knowing what those wounds mean, and there is no joy apart from knowing what those wounds mean. I know this is hard to comprehend, but in eternity, brethren, when we are finally in the presence of a holy God, the very sight or the very comprehension of that awesome God, holy as he is, who cannot tolerate sin or recognize sin or condone sin in his presence, when we are actually there in the presence of that holy, perfect God. Let me tell you, there is only one thing in heaven that will give us continual peace and continual freedom from fear of that God, and that will be the eternal presence of that wounded lamb. You follow me? That is the reason we have peace with God now is because by faith we have laid hold of that wounded lamb as ours. And we dare to face God, and yet with peace, for we know that by that blessed body which was given for us, Christ went to Calvary to become a ransom for us. In Colossians 1, if you'll turn there for just a moment, Paul speaks of that body he speaks of that body of flesh that belonged to the Lord Jesus. And listen in verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him, that is, by Christ, to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I want you to think for just a moment what Paul said was accomplished through the body of Christ's flesh. First of all, you who were alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works to God. He hath now reconciled. You know what reconciled means? To make one. To bring two who had been separated and estranged 
together. The cross was not for the purpose of reconciling God to man. It was for the purpose of reconciling man to God. There was never any problem on God's part. God loves sinners. He hates sin, but he loves sinners. He loved them so much that he gave his son for them. He gave his son that by the offering of that body in death, there might be a reconciliation made that we who were once his enemies and once alienated from him might be reconciled to him. And this results in peace. And the peace is only through the blood of his cross. And what is the end result of it all? Why we who are sinners and alienated by wicked works in our minds from God, who were his enemies, who were estranged and cut off without hope and without help, we now have peace through the blood of Christ and through the offering of that blessed body. We not only have been reconciled to God, but in such a precious way that one day he will present us to himself holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Do you know that when we are in heaven, brethren, that because of that blessed body of flesh, we will stand in the presence of God, and oh, only faith can lay hold of this, we will stand in the presence of God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. Isn't that wonderful? And Jesus said, and he told Paul to tell us, come together and take together that bread and lift together that cup. And when you pick up that bread, remember me, that it was through this body broken for you that you were reconciled that your peace with God has been possible, and that your final presentation in heaven, holy and unblameable and unreprovable, is made sure. And now that cup, Jesus said to Paul, was the cup of the New Testament in his blood, too lengthy to go into that new covenant. But through the covenant of Calvary, that eternal and everlasting covenant made by the blood of Christ. God was able to fulfill the terms of that promised covenant, and the promise was, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And where remission of these is, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. And through the blood of that covenant, represented by that cup, Jesus said, Arrangements would be made with God by him that would cause our sins and our iniquities to be forgiven, separated from us, and remembered no more by God against us. So this, then, is the symbolic meaning of the cup. Now I call to your attention the simple fact that the Lord's Supper, observed by believers, is to be in remembrance of him. I know I've impressed this on you many times. I impress it on you again because tonight we're going to practice, you see, what we're preaching this morning. The Lord's Supper is in remembrance of him. He himself, Jesus, not in remembrance of the cross, not in remembrance of the events of the cross, not in remembrance of salvation or redemption or the finished work or a doctrine or a teaching or a creed or not in remembrance of Holy Communion Sunday or because it is something we have promised to do, but as oft as we do it, and that liberty is left 
to the discretion of the believers. As oft as we do it, we are to do it in remembrance of him. You know, when people go away, they sometimes say, remember me. Think about me. Remember me while I'm gone. Now, they don't expect you to go in and pick up their possessions and remember their things. They themselves want to be remembered and held precious in your hearts so that when they return, there will be a continuation of that same precious relationship that you've enjoyed while absent. Jesus was going away, and he said, Remember me. But he wanted himself remembered in a special way. And I'm sorry to throw this in. He didn't say, Remember my birthday. He didn't say, Remember my teaching. He didn't say, remember my deeds, my miracles, the wonders I performed. Remember my body and my blood and why it was given. Remember me in my death. This is the way he wants to be remembered in the hearts of the Christian. We cannot remember him in any other sense and have the love for Jesus that he wants us to have. Love for Jesus is born in the remembrance of his death for us. Paul said unto Christ, who loved me and gave himself for me. And as he remembered that Christ gave himself for him, he remembered that Christ must surely love him. And remembering that Christ must surely love him, Paul said later, the love of Christ constrains me. So this was the means by which we are often to be reminded that he loves us and he gave himself for us. Remember me, he said. And I can remember many, many, many so-called holy communion services when I never remembered him. I remembered that it was communion, and I remembered the cup, and I remembered about taking the bread, and I remembered that there were some words said about the holy ordinance of holy communion. But Jesus said, remember me, me, Jesus, the one who loved you, the one who gave his body for you, and the one who shed his blood for you. Now, the word remembrance in the original means to see by faith. It means to call to mind, to have a mental image. You know what it means to see something in the heart? To see by faith or to have a mental image? to call to mind and hence relive an experience that's now past. This is the word remembrance. And Jesus says that by this means he desires that we break bread and lift the cup together, that we might have a new mental image, that we might see again by faith, that we might call to mind again as though it were the first time Jesus in his death. Now in John 14, when he spoke of the Holy Spirit coming, he said, he will bring all things to your what? Remembrance. So it is the Holy Spirit's work to do this. We can't do this. When we come to the Lord's Supper tonight, we're not supposed to close our eyes and grit our teeth and try to conjure up a mental image of what the Lord did for us in his death or to conjure up some mental appreciation of his love for us. Yet this I fear, 
is what we are taught at least by precept in the religious world today, with all of the soft organ music and the candlelight and the meditation, we are to conjure up in our minds by human effort some feeling in our hearts about his death for us. No, that may be religious, but it is not spiritual. For all that is done for the believer and all that is done in the believer is the work of the Holy Spirit. If tonight I am to remember Jesus as he gave his body and shed his blood, it will only be because the Holy Spirit has been able to create in me a new remembrance, a fresh mental image, enabled me to call to mind and see again by faith this blessed Savior who died for me. The Holy Spirit must do that, and he does not do it, and he cannot do it apart from the word of God. And now we have a little word which needs explaining. It is the word declare. In verse 26, ye do show or declare the Lord's death till he come. Now, Paul tells us by the use of this word that in the Lord's Supper, as such, as observed by Christians, there was to be a showing or a declaration of the Lord's death. The word declare means to thoroughly expound or tell thoroughly. It's from the root word of messenger. It is translated various ways in the New Testament, such as to show, to declare, to preach, to teach, to expound thoroughly, to discourse. And Paul is simply stating that in the Lord's Supper there is to be a thorough discourse, a full showing from the Word of God of the Lord's death. And through the preaching of the Lord's death, the Holy Spirit, by the use of that word, will create in the believer's heart a special remembrance. Now, you know that's true without me telling you that, don't you? For instance, you always remember about Calvary. There's never a time when Calvary, as a historical event, slips your mind. You know about it. You always remember about it. But is it not true that when the cross is preached in the power of the Holy Spirit that there is a new appreciation of it? That you see it again. That you're made to actually be there once more and you see what the Lord Jesus did for you. And just, I often say, it's like getting saved all over again. You fall in love all over again with the Lord Jesus. And this is what should accompany and must accompany the special remembrance of the Lord's Supper. Why? None of us are spiritual enough to pick up a piece of cracker and look at it and by mental endeavor make it say anything to us. None of us are spiritual enough to pick up a little glass of grape juice and look into that grape juice and have a new and fresh and real appreciation of the work of Calvary. We may remember it in our minds by that method, but nothing will get to our hearts. And I've looked into many a communion cup and at many a piece of cracker and got nothing. Haven't you? First of all, I had forgotten in my heart what it was like when Jesus died for me, and oh, I wish before that communion someone had stood up and thoroughly declared in the power of the Holy Spirit what Jesus did for me. Because when that message was over, I would have seen again. My heart would have been opened once more, and I would have said, oh, Lord, you did give your body for me. You did shed your blood for me. Then that cup and that cracker would have meant something. Then I would have seen in them both the symbolic form of his blood and his bread. 
They would still have been cracker and they still would have been grape juice. But oh, to lift that cup and look in it and know that a cup that once was filled with my sin and death has now become a cup of blessing. And to look at that bread and know that that blessed body bear my sins to the cross of Calvary. That's real. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord's Supper isn't something extra to be tacked on to a morning service because it happens to be Holy Communion Sunday. It is a very special time of blessing and privilege that believers are to come together and just take time out from whatever else we've been doing in the assembly and time out from whatever we've been thinking and sit down around that table and be reminded again of Jesus. Do you agree? We need that. We need it. For the completion of this message, please turn the tape over. Following that thorough telling of the gospel again, that rehearsal of his death, do you know what will happen in the hearts of those who hear that discourse? Well, if it is performed in the energy of the Holy Spirit, that preaching of Jesus' death for you <clears throat> will do a couple of things in your heart. First, it will convict you. It will thoroughly search your heart. You will be made to see where you stand in relationship to him in fellowship. You will see how much you have forgotten. You will see, perhaps, if you have left that first love. You will see if your heart has grown cold and indifferent. And there will be a soul searching like there was that first night. For when Jesus had finished his thorough discourse on the meaning of the Passover, and it came time to pick up the cup and the bread, each person there was saying one thing, Lord, is it I? Do you remember that? Then they broke that bread and drank that cup. This is the meaning of Paul's words here about the examination of a man's heart. Who can examine a man's heart and say it's fit to break bread and to partake of the cup in holy fellowship and remembrance of Christ? I am not fit to tell you that you can come to the Lord's Supper, and you're not fit to tell me and I'm not fit to examine my own heart, for it is desperately wicked and deceitful above all else, and who can know it? But there is one who is able to examine me, the blessed Lord Jesus, who is not only able to take his precious word and examine my heart in the light of Calvary, and oh, I've never really seen the cross by faith, under the sound of the word that my heart wasn't purged was yours and cleansed and made ready for fellowship I wasn't ready for a little bit ago. This is the examination of the saints of God. But there are some, Paul says, who perhaps will not submit to that. And if you will not submit to the Lord Jesus to take his word and search your heart and convict you and cleanse you by the preaching of the cross, then he will judge you and he will chasten you. It may be that you will be removed from the assembly by sickness or death so that you will not come to that Lord's Supper lacking discernment of his body and his blood. For if you should do that, it will only increase that condemnation which you know in your own heart before the Lord. There's been so much discussion about uh, communion, so-called. Who should come? First, it is the Lord's table. 
No man can police it. No man can say, you can come and you can't. Just one requirement, that you have rested in what that body and that blood has done for sinners. One requirement, that Jesus is your Savior. Oh, but you say, I must be in fellowship with the Lord. <laughs> who can say who is in fellowship? Who can say when we are in fellowship? We may be in fellowship this second and maybe not this next second. I'll tell you what you are to bring tonight to this supper. Bring a needy heart. Bring a willing heart. A heart that will say, Lord, I don't know what's in my heart. I don't know where I stand. I don't know what I need. But Lord, I know your body was given for me and your blood was shed for me. Now, Lord, take me again to your cross and show me in a special remembrance what you did for me. Make my love new and real. Then let me take that bread and that cup and let me know that fellowship with you that is real. That's what he wants. You know, in uh, Luke 24 on the Emmaus Road, and you've heard me say this so often, but repetition is the only proper way to teach. All of the post-resurrection appearances of the Lord Jesus, the appearances made after he was raised from the dead on earth to his disciples, they fascinate me. They have for years because I see in them a complete general outline of his dealings in personal fellowship with his people through the age of grace. Each of these post-resurrection appearances were appearances to individuals where he dealt with them in their own hearts about their own relationship to him. This was not doctrinal teaching. This was not uh, building them up in creeds and in doctrines. This was personal ministry by the Lord Jesus to needy hearts. And so I love that story of the Emmaus disciples because it starts out with these disciples walking down a Emmaus road which I always call the road of life. Going away from Jerusalem, the city of the double peace, going farther and farther away from that place of peace, down the road of life, all burdened and miserable over the, the affairs of life. They had thought this and they had thought that, and it hadn't worked out like they thought. They had planned this and planned that, and all had failed. And they weren't even aware that Jesus lived. Yet he was with them all the time and walked with them down that road, and they didn't even know he was with them. They thought he was a stranger. And oh, isn't there times in your life, there is in mine, where he's a stranger? I know he's with me. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. But I go down the road of life all wrapped up in the affairs of life and burdened because I planned it this way and it didn't come out and I thought this and it didn't work out. And here they were going down the road. They weren't trying to get back in fellowship with the Lord. They weren't asking anybody for help. They were just miserable and sad and turning to each other like man out of fellowship with Christ always does. He turns to some human being to lean on him. And they were leaning on each other, licking their wounds, and walking down the road of life. And Jesus began to minister to them. And what did he do? He began at Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And he began to tell thoroughly or to declare the meaning of those things written in the word concerning himself. And the subject was his death at Jerusalem. 
for the remission of sins. And as he began to expound Calvary, the love of God and the love of Christ, you know, something happened in the lives of those disciples. A moment before they were out of fellowship with the Lord, a moment before he said they were filled with unbelief and hardness of heart, but do you know a short time later by the time they reached their home, their hearts were burning within. The unbelief was gone. The hardness of heart had been transformed into a soft and broken and contrite heart. And they found that they had one great desire, and that desire was, Oh, Lord, abide with us. And when they came to that point, they were ready. And it says that Jesus came in and he broke bread with them. Then they went out. Their faces reflected the reality of that fellowship. And they met other men in the road of life and they declared unto them these things that had been done in them and how their hearts burned within them as he opened the scriptures and how he was made known unto them in the breaking of the bread. This is the examination we need. This is the purging and the cleansing that we need. And this is the fellowship that we need. Bring to this supper, bring to this gathering, bring to this assembly a heart. You don't need to know the depths of that heart, nor all of its wickedness. You don't need to be able to give an accurate description of your present fellowship with the Lord. You come, lay open your heart to the Word of God and to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let Jesus do as he did in that upper room that night. Rise and gird himself with a towel and wash your feet. And he will wash you and cleanse you and make you fit to take that bread and that cup. And you will remember his death. And you will remember that this is only until he comes. For when he comes, we will have no use of that cracker, and that cup will be meaningless. For all of the symbols will have passed away, and we will possess the blessed reality of feasting with him at his table throughout eternity. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, there's the word, and open the door. I will come in and sup with him, feast with him, have supper with him, and he with me. <laughs> he feasts with us here now. He will take supper with us tonight. And there is coming a blessed time when we will take supper with him. That will be the married supper of the Lamb. You cannot look at Calvary in the power of the Holy Spirit without being broken and brought back to a love you once knew for Christ. I guarantee that. <clears throat> I'll give you one little example, and then I will close. Peter, who got carried away with the affairs of life, who got disturbed about the course that things were taking, who begin to think as for believers get into trouble. And when the pressure got on, he couldn't stand. And standing outside the judgment hall that night, warming himself at the fire of the world, wanting at the sacrifice of his fellowship with Jesus, wanting the acceptance of the world, wanting the warmth of their fellowship, acceptance in their midst. He stood there. He didn't plan to do anything but just stand there unnoticed and kind of enjoy it. But you see, 
the road to compromise is death. And soon he was put in worse circumstances, for he was called upon to curse the very Lord he loved. And he said with an oath and with a curse, I know him not. Well, Peter surely will never, never, never know the Lord's fellowship again, will he? Peter is in such a state now that he will never get things worked out in his heart with the Lord. No, he never will. The most blessed thing is that Peter was the sheep and Jesus was the shepherd. And it was Jesus' work, not Peter's. And it began that night. It began that night with a look. Jesus made Peter look at him when he came out of the judgment hall. What was he doing? I'll tell you what he was doing. He was coming out of that judgment hall condemned for Peter, bearing Peter's sins to Calvary. And Peter saw him, and Peter knew where he was going and what he was going to do there. And one look at that blessed Savior on his way to Calvary. Peter didn't run into his arms. He wasn't ready just yet for that. But he did go outside in the darkness alone, and he wept bitterly. Well, Peter never will get straightened out. Oh, yes, he will. Because just as soon as the resurrection took place, Jesus said, Go tell my disciples and Peter that I go before them. I will see them. And he met his disciples, and he met Peter. And he met him at the Sea of Tiberias when Peter, out on the sea, trying to forget all that had happened, throwing himself into the lawful, lawful pursuits of life in hopes that he could forget about a broken fellowship with Jesus. Even I'm sure, convinced now, that he must never really have loved the Lord, for how could a man have done what he did that night and love the Lord? He did what he did that night because he did not know the potential of his poor, wretched heart. And frustrated and broken-hearted, out on the sea, alone at night, the Lord called him. Alone because, oh, he had human company. I'm talking about spiritually alone. And the Lord called him and he said, Children, have you any meat? And Peter knew that he didn't have anything for himself and he didn't have anything for others. He just had one great big empty net and one big empty heart and one big empty life and then Jesus called, come and die. Peter threw himself overboard in humiliation, come paddling to shore and came up, and Jesus had prepared a supper for him. Fish upon the fire and bread. He said, come, Peter. And there in that communion, he asked Peter's heart a searching question. Peter, lovest thou me? And the scripture says that when he said that, he showed himself to Peter. What does that mean? He gave Peter a new look at his wounds. Without a word, Peter, lovest thou me? As though to say, is there any doubt, Peter, that I love you? Have I failed you? Do you see anything, Peter? that tells your heart whether you love me or not? And I know Peter was made to look upon those hands and that side and that face that was marred so terribly that he no longer resembled a human being, that that back that had been plowed like a freshly furred field, and Peter blurted out, O oh Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And I think if Peter could have a little more, he might have said something like this, Oh, Lord, I don't know whether I ever loved you before, but this I know. I love you now. We need that. We need that. It's what the Lord's Supper is all about. Let us pray. Thank you, Father, that the work of searching our hearts and cleansing them and bringing them into fellowship with Jesus is not ours. 
This is the work of the Lord Jesus through the Word and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now just give us hearts that will submit to that searching. Give us hearts that will, will dare to accept the challenge to be brought to Calvary again for another look. Then bring us to that bread and to that cup to remember him and his death. Pray that you would bring to this meeting tonight every person who has a needy heart, who loves Jesus, or who is not sure whether they love him or not, or who wants to love him. Bring them, Father, and may the Holy Spirit make them to face him tonight at Calvary and say, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. Now send us out of this meeting to think upon these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.